Okay, now I'm recording. So that right there, okay, is an example of both N and also P. The N means I don't pay attention to detail, so I do not have a checklist of things that I go through. Okay, you know, am I doing this? Am I doing this? Am I doing this? And then the P one is, well, I mean, you know, I just forget it. It's okay. You know, to me, it is actually okay. But to a J person, it is probably okay. The, the, P, the J person will be kicking himself or herself, you know, all the way through the entire class. As, a, as opposed to me, it's like, eh, it's okay. You know, this part is not as important as the rest of the class. So I still get to catch the rest of the class. I'm good to go. Okay, so kind of, you know, it, it's... It's very subtle, okay, you know, but psychology does play an important part of, you know, how you can strategize, you know, how you study and how you move on, you know, to your career and so on. And also how you, you know, interact with other people, you know, because without understanding, you know, what the other person is, a lot of times, you know, there can be misunderstanding. So, so I'm going to stop there, you know, talking about, you know, psychology. And then we're going to move on and continue to talk about the slide that we were talking about before. So I'm hoping that all of you had a chance to make sure that you don't have any additional questions from the discussion on Monday, because in, and also to have a chance to kind of went through at least the stuff that I have talked about in class, particularly, you know, how do you differentiate an AND transistor from a P transistor and also how the circuit works, you know, the circuit that we built on Monday. So, you know, I hope all of you, you know, now understand how a NAND 2 gate is, you know, gets the job done. All right, so here's the, uh, the four transistor NAND gate. You know, we have seen this before already. And the notes actually go through all four possible scenarios. Like, you know, what if we have a zero and a zero as the input here? The output is going to be a one because in this case, we have both of these Q1, Q2 being on. So the output pin has two paths basically to go to the source of the ones, but because Q3 and Q4 are both off, so we have no path to go to the source of the zeros. And as a result, the output pin is going to report a one. So we talked about that, you know, in class also. So by reading the notes, okay, you can also get reinforcement of the concepts that we talk about in class. Are we doing okay? Are there any questions about all of this stuff? Yep, go ahead. The input always has an N and P The input will always Well, in this particular design, yes. But in general, kind of yes to, because you know all logic gates are based on transistors, and the one port of a transistor that can determine one thing or another is the gate. The source versus the drain is really so. When you look at it, just an electrical switch, not even a transistor, um, the lever itself is the gate. Okay, because that is how you control whether the circuit is closed, then you have a connection or the circuit is open where the, the connection is broken. The drain versus the source really has to do with the terminal behind the switch itself that you do not get to see because nobody wants to touch 110 volts live. As a child, I actually touched 220 volts because in Hong Kong, that is the household voltage of the electrical outlets. I was trying to plug in my light in the dark and you know, I accidentally touched the hot side of the plug. That probably explained quite a few things. <laughs> but what it felt like was interesting. It felt like somebody just hit my finger with a hammer. That's how it felt like. But I would not recommend you guys to test it. Okay, just take my words for it and just be okay with that. All right. So with this one, we have one one. And when we have one one as inputs, in this case, the Q1, Q2 are going to be off. So we do not have a single path from the output pin to the source of all the ones. But only with this one case, we have Q3 and Q4 being turned on, which means they are completing the circuit. So we do have one path 
from the output pin all the way down to the source of the zeros, and as a result, the output is a zero instead of a one. So all of this we kind of talked about on Monday already. So it is important that we kind of review the content, you know, after a class, because the next class almost always depend on what we have taught already in the previous class. So the Monday, the Wednesday is the tough one because you know it's only like two days from Monday, and you don't really have a whole lot of time to review the content of Monday. The next Monday is also tough in a way. Even though you do have five days to do it, the problem is you have five days to do it. Because most people think about the five days is like, oh, I don't have to do it today. I don't have to do it today. And then comes your know, Sunday, Sunday night, you go like, oh, I really need to do it today. And then there are also all the other, the other, all the, all the other classes that you're taking on Monday. So now you have you know, a time management issue. So either way, you have to remind yourself and set up a schedule to do it. Okay, um, and going back to the personality thing, as a P person, I really need to use my calendar to help me you know, structure my time. It's like, okay, this is when I do this, this is when I do that, and so on. Because without the external structure to help me, to help remind me to do things, um, oftentimes I'll be wandering off to do some other things that I'm interested in. So just it's just a tip, okay, for you guys to make use of your calendar, you know, as much as you can, because you know, in the past, a calendar is a piece of paper. It cannot really actively remind you to do things, but now you know, the calendar is an app, so you can rely on the app to go like, oh, it's time to do blah. It's time to study, it's time to review, it's time to do my homework, and so on. So I really strongly recommend to have a, some kind of a structure in your life. All right, so this one we have analyzed as well. There's nothing new here. And then we also talk about you know how the logic gate that we have created here, if you look at x, y as independent variable, and you look at the output as the result of the operator, the operator being the circuit itself, then we end up with this truth table here. We talked about this truth table already. Um, if the inputs are both zeros, the output is a one. And if both outputs are ones, the output is a zero. If at least one of the input is a zero, you also end up with a one as the output. So we talked about that as well. And this is also the truth table for a NAND operator. So the NAND operator is basically the negation. The exclamation point is negation in C++. Ampersand, ampersand is logical end in C++. So the NAND operator is basically just this. Okay, uh, so we talked about that a little bit. And in mathematical symbol, this is how it looks like. Because in mathematical symbols, this is negation. And this wedge symbol here is conjunction, which is basically AND or logical AND in our case. So are there any questions about all of this stuff here? This is basically a really, really fast year recap of what we have already talked about on Monday. Are we good? All right. <clears throat> so for people who are not actually good, but they do not want to raise their hand and go like, OK, I'm a little bit overwhelmed, OK? So what it means is you know, if you have concepts that you're not quite getting after a class, my office hour is right after the lab, which is 1.30 PM. So you can always follow me to the office, and then you know, we can talk about the concepts. Okay, It's not a big deal. Um, so it's, I think it's important to get everything cleared up as quickly as possible and not wait until the exam. Okay, you know, Because in the past, I have had people who say, I have not understood anything that you have said for the past few weeks. And then the next week is the final exam, or exam one, or some other exam. I go like, but you didn't let me know about that. I cannot help you because I'm not a mind reader. I cannot just look at you and say, oh, I see you're not quite understanding the concept of you know, a P transistor versus an N transistor. I cannot do that, okay? There's just no way for me to do it. So you have to let me know if you have any questions. If you don't want to ask questions in class, ask me during the office hour. All right, so we also, talked about how 
the NAND gate is the only thing you actually need. So the negation gate can be done with um, X NAND X. So NOT X is the same thing as X and NAND X. So let me kind of recap. I, I got this written down already on the other day, but I'm going to write it down again today. So what we are saying is NOT X, I'm using C++ symbol here, and double equal means you know, the value of the right-hand side should equal to the value of the other side. So this really is the same thing as x ampersand ampersand x. Does that make sense to you? Okay, even just intuitively. Because x and x is x, so not x and x is just not x. Okay, so intuitively that seems to make sense. And then we move on. So I want to kind of relate to the notes here because so that you know where we are in the notes here. So what about just you know, x and y without the negation? Well, that's not too hard to do because this is x and y with a negation. This is also x and y with a negation. We just need to figure, figure out a way to negate it. But we just figured that out earlier. So we apply the trick from 3.4.1 in order to do that one little negation, and then we just have to negate the negation of x and y. So now we have this to basically do the same thing as a regular conjunction. So I wrote this out on Monday as well using C++ notation. So you might want to refer back to that notation if you're looking at the math notation and go like, okay, I really have no idea what this is. Then go back to the notation that I used on Monday. Or is the more complicated one, because we actually have to use De Morgan's Law. We'll get into De Morgan's Law a little bit more later on in this semester. Okay, This is one of the really fun stuff that we can do in Boolean algebra. The focus of this class is not Boolean algebra, but we will use Boolean algebra as a tool. Okay, CISP 440, or discrete structure, is the class you know, where your know, Boolean algebra is the focus, not so much in this class. But knowing De Morgan's Law is going to be very helpful in many situations. All right, so we are now getting into new material, finally, which is numbers and values. So how do we represent a value or a number, but aren't those things supposed to be the same? If I say a number versus a numerical value, Aren't those things supposed to be the same? The answer is, most of the time, for most people, the answer is yes. Okay, We consider those things to be exactly the same. But in computer science, especially in this class, they are not the same. A number is a representation of a value. Okay, What does that mean? Okay, So me, right here, it's a person, okay, you know, so what is my representation? You know, what, how do I represent myself in the form? That is the question. So you guys go like, oh, you're a tech. Yes, you know, I am known as tech in the United States because that is how I chose to spell my name, which was originally in Chinese, okay? So in Hong Kong, I'm known as, in Cantonese, Laoyang, Dangying because that's how my name is supposed to be pronounced in Cantonese. But if I were to go to China and I say I'm, you know, Tak or I'm, you know, Ao Yang Ying, you know, the mainland Chinese people would go like, I have no idea what you just said. Because they speak Mandarin, okay? Yes, it's Chinese and Chinese, but the dialects can be different. So in China, I'm known as Ouyang Okay, so if you speak Cantonese, you can make fun of my can my Mandarin. But the point is, it's different. Those are all representations of me, and yet they are different. Is that okay? So how does that analogy translate to values versus numbers? Well, phase conversion. Okay, what you know as twelve. Okay is also known as, okay, I have to think about this a little bit, 1100 as a base 2 number. It is also known as 14 as a base 8 number. It is also known as C 
as a hexadecimal number. Those are all referring to the same quantity. Okay, I got. Okay, the best way to for me to describe the quantity of twelve is just this. That is the quantity of twelve. This is how we write it as a base ten number. This is how I write it as a base two number. This is how I write it as a hexadecimal number in C++ SEO syntax. And let's see, this is how I write it as a base eight number also in C++. So in C++, you can use a prefix of zero X to emphasize that you are using base 16. You can also use just a prefix of zero to indicate that you are using base eight. There are no prefixes in uh, C and C++ to uh, represent binary number, but GDB does allow the you know, zero B to be the prefix of a binary number, but not in the programming language itself. The debugger does allow that. All right, so are we doing okay so far with the, the number, which is a representation, versus the value, which is really just a quantity that we want to represent? We all good? All right. So now we are officially done with this module, which means it's time to move on to the next one. So in this class, you know, I really do not want to have to remind people um, is basically when we are done with one module, it's just continuing on, you know, move on to the next one. So the next actual module, I mean, you know, if you read all of this stuff here, it's great because now you understand how I test the circuit that you submit, okay? The test circuit that you made use of, hopefully, on Monday is a way to kind of quickly check to whether to see whether your circuit works the way it's supposed to. But I'm gonna bypass that one a little bit, and then we move on to values, numbers, and bases, which is about uh, base conversion. So we'll take a look at this one. And before we really going to get into the details. Let me just give you guys a chance to ask questions. Okay, are there any questions up to this point? Yes? Um, this was not about the information we covered, but I was asking, are we going to have any practice tests at the end of the upcoming exams? Yes, so uh, the usual way that I do things is one week before an exam, I'll give you a quote unquote um, Okay, I'm not going to say practice test. I'll give you the test that I gave in the previous semester. So that's how I always do it, is I will give you exactly one version of the test that I used in the previous semester. So it's not even intended as a practice test. It really was the test from a semester ago. So I always do that one week prior to your test or the exam. Um, so that means, you know, knowing what I asked in the previous semester is going to help and also not help you. Because I do not use the same kind of questions, or typically I do not use the same kind of questions, but you will know the scope of you know, what I'll be including in the exam. So did that answer your question? Okay, excellent. Any other questions? That's a good question. You know, it's good to ask it like way ahead of time instead of like two weeks before an exam. So good job. Any other questions before we move on and talk about base conversion? No questions? All right. So we're going to get into base conversion. And the first thing is, you know, what is a number? We just talked about it, so I'm not going to spend too much time to talk about that. Um, and then counting is just a general thing about your know, numbers and why we have numbers. The whole point about numbers is it's a tool of communication. Okay, if you want to tell me that I owe you five bucks, how do I know the quantity of money that I owe you? Okay, so we have to agree on okay the digits, you know, the way we you know, where we put the digits and so on and so forth. You know, why do we put the hundred? on the left-hand side of the 10, and then the 10 on the left-hand side of the one. It is arbitrary. 
Okay, it is arbitrary. It is just that we need to have an agreement so that you know we can communicate. Okay, so a lot of those conventions really do not have a particular reason. It's just okay, we just agree to do it this way, so we all understand how to interpret a number. All right, so we are going to get started with base conversion, and I, it's time to take roll. So. Uh, if you have not signed into Canvas, go ahead and sign into Canvas. You're either using your mobile device or using your uh, the computer in front of you. And I'm going to make the role taking activity available now, which is this one here. I got it all set up today, but I do need to give you the access code. So the access code is right here, the old password. And I can write it on the whiteboard just in case. The old password in camel case. That's the password to the activity. You should be able to see it now. And since I wrote it on the whiteboard, I am going to switch back to the notes over here, and I'll just kind of wait for most of you to be done. If you have no access to a computer, which is really rare because this is a classroom of computers, um, you, know, you can always you know, write your name on a piece of paper and give me that slip of paper. But you have to sign in or use a computer anyway because you know, we have a lab. And in the lab, you know, we have to at least get to Canvas, and for, for today's lab, we're going to use LogiSim. So for the most part, there is no need to ask me, is there a lab today? Because the default answer to that question is, yes, we are going to have lab today. The only exception would be the days when we have uh, an exam. So this way, you know, I don't have anything taught. And as a result, there's no lab to practice on things that I have taught. But other than that, yes, we do have lab by default. Otherwise, we would not have scheduled a lab section, you know, on your schedule. On your schedule. Okay. So from the looks of it, most people are done with the role taking activity. So for the people who are trying to catch up, you know, this is the password to get into the activity. All right. How many people have already learned how to do base conversion into base to some other base? So we got mm, a few people, you know, but for the rest of the class, you know, um, you have not uh, been taught how to do base conversion. But I'm going to say this: you already know how to do base conversion, and you have already done a better job than just knowing how to do base conversion. So, what do you mean by that? Okay. So we're going to start with an example, and I might have some example over here, but I'm going to. I would choose to use a different example using my tablet here. Okay, so we'll just pretend that you're working for McDonald's and you need to make change you know, for a certain amount. Is that okay? All right, so we're going to look at the amount here. I'm just going to come up with a number. Uh, let's say it's $12 and I have to pick a number that is, that, that's good for me to work with. So I have to be a little bit careful here. Mm, 25 cents. Yeah, 25 cents would be good. There we go. Okay. So this is the amount that you need to change using your bills and coins and stuff like that. So the easiest way to get this done is 1,225 pennies. What do you think will happen if that is what you do at McDonald's? You just basically count 1,225 pennies and give it to the customer and go like, that's a change. Well, I don't think the customer will appreciate it. <laughs> Here's a big, huge bag of pennies and that's a change. Okay, so we probably want to say, well, using the least number of bills and coins. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. So. If that is your exam question, do you think you can ace this particular question? Do you think you know how to do it? 
Okay, but how do you how do you know what to do? Okay, is it one ten dollar one ten dollar bill, two one dollar bills, and a quarter? Why a quarter but not two dimes and a nickel? Right? You know this intuitively because you have done it so many times. And if you know how to do this, you already know base conversion. You go like, I don't understand. How does this has anything to do with base conversion? So to understand that, okay, because what I want to do is to bridge what you already know about making change to the concept of base conversion. Because if you know how to do this, you really just know how to do base conversion already. You just do not know that you already know how to do base conversion. Okay, because the technique to do this is harder. All right, so let's talk about you know denomination in uh, U.S. currency. Okay, so if you are uh, if you know some other types of currency, you can kind of compare and contrast. But we'll focus on just the U.S. currency system. So for stuff that is actually important here. We have $20 bills, and then we have $10 bills, we have $5 bills, we have $1 bills. Yes, I know we have $2 bills, but those are really rare, so I'm going to not take that into consideration. And if I go down, you know, we have quarters. Yes, I also know we have half dollar coins, but once again, those are really rare, and I'm not going to include those. And then from that, we go to a dime. And then we go down to a penny, I mean a nickel, and then all the way down to a penny. Um, as once a you know, immigrant, you know, to this country, it took me a while to learn, you know, not only the denomination but also the terms to refer to the denomination. It's a penny. It's a nickel. It is a dime. It's a quarter. Now that makes sense, right? But the other one is like. Nickel, I guess, makes sense too because it refers to the metal that is used to make the coin. But the penny, why, why is it called a penny? Uh, or why is it called a dime? I mean, I'm pretty sure there are reasons why they're called the way they're called. But to a foreign person who already has enough stuff to learn, just learning those terms for the coins, for the currency, is like, that's an extra thing that I have to do. Okay, but the focus here is not the name. It is about the the um, the multiplication factor between each one. So between these two, we have a factor of two. Between these two, we have a factor of two again. You go like, oh, okay. So there's a pattern. No, there's not a pattern. There's a five here. You go like, okay, the next one has got to be either two or five. No, it is a four. And then between these two, it's not even a whole number. It is 2.5. Who comes up with this? And then between these two, it's like 5 again. Then you go like, oh, the next one is probably a 4 because we're repeating a pattern. No. <laughs> oh, I missed, I missed that, right? So that's a 2. And then there's a 5. Thank you. <laughs> Do you see a repeating pattern? Nope. There's no repeating pattern. And yet, you have mastered this, right? So intuitively, you already know how to do this. How do you do this? It's like, oh, I just have to move from the highest denomination that is relevant to me and figure out how many of these do I need. And then for the remainder portion, move down to the next highest denomination and figure out how many do I need for this. And then take that off, okay, if you have one or more. And then for the remaining portion, you, you know, continue with strategy. So you already intuitively know how to do this, even when the multipliers are all over the place. OK, so now what about base conversion? If I want to be a politician, my platform is going to be, let's go to binary numbers. I think that I would get a lot of votes from my students. <laughs> but no one else. Okay, so what would that look like? So I would start with a dollar bill in the middle, and then we move on to two dollar bills, four dollar bills, eight dollar bills, sixteen dollar bills, and so on. Do you see a pattern? They're all doubling on your way up. So what do you think I'm going to do on my way down to the coins? Half divided by two, right? 
So we're going to end up with half dollar you know, coins, quarter dollar coins, and I'm not even going to like an eighth here. Okay, this is an eighth of a dollar. So if this is a new currency system, can you figure out how to make change for twelve dollars and twenty five cents? No, I no, I don't. Yes, you do. <laughs> you already know the strategy of doing it. It's just that you, if you cannot intuitively do the same thing that you do with the normal currency, because we, this is the first time you do it. But it's the same strategy. So you look at twelve dollars and twenty five cents. And you move down here and go like, do I need a 16? No, I don't need a 16. Um, do I need an 8? Yes. Okay, you got one of the 8. Then you have $4.25 left, right? So you're moving down to the $4 thing. Do you need a $4? Yeah, we need one of those. You know. Then you have $0.25, right? So with $0.25, do we need a $2? Nope, none of those, none of those. Do, do I need a half dollar when I only have a quarter of a dollar left? Nope, none of those. I do want, need one of these and none of those. Okay, so you look at this and go like, okay, fine. We are just figuring out you know, how many of each denomination we need. I do not see a binary number. Oh yeah, there's a binary number here. You just have to tilt your head to see it. So the way you tilt your head, is to tilt it 90 degrees clockwise, like that, okay? And there's a decimal point too. The decimal point is going to be here. In other words, if I rewrite this entire thing so that you don't have to tilt your head and then go, and then you need a trip to your chiropractor, I'll do it for you. That is a base two representation of the same quantity. So I'm going to use a subscript of 2 here just to emphasize that this is a base 2 number and not a base 10 number. But it's the same strategy, okay? I know it sounds and feels really kind of awkward, but that's only because, you know, this is the first time you think about, you know, bills and coins in these, you know, kind of awkward denominations. But this will be super easy for someone who's new to the country to learn how to do all this stuff here. Because, you know, all the multipliers are by two. And the other good thing about this is you never have to worry about, oh, we need two of these and three of those. Think about $13. And um, $13.97, okay? So you will need, what? 110, you know, in, in, in normal denomination. Oh, I thought you were talking yeah. about Yeah, in normal denomination, you need 110, and then you have three ones, right? And then you get down to the coins, you have three quarters and two pennies. So not only do you need to figure out, uh, do I need any of these? You need to figure out how many of those do I need, which is division. With this one, you, can, you only end up with either none or one of those. So you can you only you only need to do comparison. Greater than or equal to, yes, there's one, less than zero. There's no division. Do you see the, the appeal of binary numbers? And do you see my potential as a politician? No. Be <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be a politician. But I think there is an appeal because of the practicality of binary numbers. So if binary numbers are so great, why do we have base 10 numbers? It started off with because we have 10 fingers. And you know, back in those times, you know, people did not figure out, you know, have not figured out your know, binary numbers yet. Okay, because you know, when we first count, you know, when, when the earliest people started counting, they're not thinking about algebra, they're not thinking about base conversion, they're not thinking about you know, power exponents or anything like that, which is kind of what you need to figure out the binary numbers. So we naturally just started to use you know, 10, you know, base 10, because we got 10 fingers. And then it got stuck. Okay, so by tradition, by culture, by language, and all of those things that are 
in a certain way holding us back, is holding us back also when it comes to how we represent values. Okay, so we are kind of stuck with a system that is not really making a whole lot of sense. But because that's what we have been using, you know, globally by you know, you know billions of people, it's hard to change because the momentum is too much. So, so there we go. Any questions about you know this example of how we did the base conversion? What about the other way around? Okay, what if somebody wants to? kind of convert it in a backward manner. So in other words, if I give you a binary number, can we convert it back into a form that we you know, understand and easy, uh, into base 10, basically? OK, so we'll take a look at, I'm just randomly throwing out a number here. OK, so let's say this is the amount in base 2. So how do we figure out the base 10 representation of this thing here? What are the zeros and ones telling you? Depending on the position of the digit, is telling you the number of a specific power of two. What are the powers of two? Well, we just saw the powers of two. Okay, all of these. Okay, sixteen, eight, four, two, one, point five, point two five, point one two five. Those are all powers of two. Okay, some are really obvious. Like sixteen is like, yeah, you can see that. You know. Yeah, this one too. This one is cool. This one is a little bit tricky. This one is tricky for some people, but you know, if you kind of retain your high school math, you would still go like, yeah, anything to the power of zero is one. What about these guys here? Two to the power of negative one, two to the power of negative two, and two to the power of negative three. In other words, all of these are powers of two. And the number is really just telling us how many of each of these powers of 10 do I need to add up to the amount that the number is supposed to be representing. Does that make sense? All right, okay. So now, if I switch to the number that we want to convert, we look at this and go like, oh, we can just use that other table. Because this is telling me how many ones we have, this is how many twos we have, how many fours, how many eights, how many sixteens, how many halves, how many quarters, and how many eighths. So we, in this case, we have a sixteen, we have a two, we have a fourth, and then we have an eighth. So these two add up to 18, these two add up to 0.375. So when you add up these two, we have 18.375. So now we can go the opposite way. Are there any questions about base conversion? You know, in this case, very specifically, base two conversion. Questions? You all good? What about, yes, go ahead. So how do we have That's a good question. So I think you're asking, you know, where is the most significant digit? The most, signif the most significant digit is the leftmost digit when you use a number. So in this case, I'm only giving you eight digits. You have five on the left-hand side of the point and then three on the right-hand side of the point. But that's only because I don't want to spend eternity to write zeros. What do you mean by writing, you know, spending eternity to write zeros? Well, it means I can pad a zero for the 32, a zero for the 64, a zero for the 128, and I can keep doing this until I die. And it would not change the value being represented because I have, a, I have zero of all of the more, the higher powers of two. So you know, conventionally, we just say, okay, don't write the leading zeros, okay? Because it's meaningless. You're just using space. What about the other side? Well, I guess you know I can spend my next lifetime to write all the zeros you know on the right hand side, because oh by the way, okay, and let me get rid of the subscript here. I also have zero of the sixteenth, zero of the thirty seconds, 
zero of the 64th, and so on. And I can pack zeros infinitely on the right-hand side without changing the value that I'm representing because I got none of those. So I just you know, stop at three digits because, you know, well, I mean, that's good enough for what I want to represent. So that's a good question. You know, it's just that, you know, I you just normally we use as many as we need and we just stop and go like, okay, we don't need any more. But when it comes to um, how we use a binary representation inside the memory of a computer, then we kind of need to be more explicit because a 32-bit number is a 32-bit number. So even though we are only using like five of those, we still have to spell out the rest are zeros. So when we get to that point, we'll I'll emphasize you know, what we need to do. Okay, any other questions? That was a very good point. No other questions? All right. So conceptually, we understand how a number represents a value now, right? Because each digit, each position in a number is really just specifying the quantity of a power of the base. Okay, what do you mean by base? Well, in this case, we're using base two. Okay, so let me go to this side and use the mouse pointer. This is all in base two. And in the previous page, this is in base 10. That is the base, okay? In other words, what kind of powers are we talking about? Are we talking about powers of 10, powers of two, and or what, you know, what kind of power are we talking about? So someone probably has a question right now is like, hmm, so besides your know, 2 and 10, can we use other types of powers? And the answer is, yeah, you can use any, at least any natural number as a base other than 0 itself. So what about 7? Okay, can we use a base, you know, can we use base 7? And what is it going to look like? Now, fractions is a little bit tricky when it comes to base 7 because um, writing out a fraction of seven in base 10 is a little bit tedious, okay? So I'm not gonna deal with the fractional part, but I can still deal with the non-fractional part, okay? So let's just say that we have a number 2001, okay? Because it's a nice movie, I'm gonna use that in base 10, and I wanna figure out what it looks like as a base seven number. How do we figure that out? It's equal to blah, blah, blah in base seven. How do we figure this out? What would be your approach? Can you think about what we did with base two? And then go like, oh, all we have to do is to change that approach a little bit, and we can still use the same strategy. The template of the approach is still applicable. So can you extract the template of the approach that we just used for base two conversion? What was the first thing that I did? I listed out all the powers of two. Okay, so, but that's an idea. Okay, so, so okay, so we can do that. Okay, we start with a one, which is seven to the power of zero. Seven is seven to the power of one. Forty-nine is seven to the power of two, and then seven to the power of three is seven times that, which is three hundred and forty-three. How do I know that? How do you how do you figure out forty-nine times seven? is 343. Hmm? Yep. But how do you know that? Without a calculator, without a piece of paper, doing mental math. It's a trick. It's just a trick. You bump the 49 to a 50, and you go like, OK, do I know what is 7 times 50? Yeah, that's an easy one. You know, it's 350. Oh, but wait. It's, it was actually 49 times 7. So the 50 times 7 is going to give you an answer that's 7 more than what you need. Can we subtract 7 from 350 without a calculator or a piece of paper? I hope so. So that's how we got 343. So you know, I would kind of digress a little bit sometimes you know, to kind of teach you all of these tricks here because these tricks represent basically just a way of using what you already know, which is algebra, okay? And you're just reapplying the techniques and the basic core math concepts. 
that you already know in a practical way and go like, okay, I don't have a piece of paper, I don't have a calculator, how do I figure this out? So that's how we do it. Okay, I think that is all we need because seven times 300 and something is more than 2001 already. So I know, that's how I know we, we got enough powers of seven already. Is that okay? All right. So now the first thing we need to do is to divide 2001 by um, 343. All right. Well, there are several ways to do it. Okay, let me, we'll, we'll do it this way first. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is to figure out how many 343 do we have in 2001? Well, I just said something that would basically answer this question, right? I said seven times 340 something is going to be more than 2001 because seven times 300 is already you know, 2100. So I know it cannot be seven here, but it cannot be five either. So it has to be six, okay? So we have six of those, okay? So now I have to do some actual math because I have to multiply 343 by six. So we got eight, five, two, two, zero, five, six, five, eight, okay? So we sub, oh, that's, that means your know, six is not the right answer either, is it? <laughs> I just made a poo poo and, you know, they're like, ah, oh, okay, I made a mistake. All right. But this is also a great moment. It's a teaching moment. What mistake did I make? Okay, I only presented the math up to a certain point, but it should be enough already to show you that I made a mistake. So which mis what mistake did I make? If you were to point to the board, okay, and point to a particular number and go like, yeah, you got that one wrong. Yes. Oh, I thought you were. So six here, this is wrong. Why? Because I just figured out you know, six times 363 is 2058 already, which is more than the value that I need to represent. So this six needs to be a five. So that means I have to redo the math here, times five, and we got five, one, two, one, seven, one, five, okay? Now, what do I do with one, uh, 1,715? What do I do with that value? Subtract it from 2001. Okay, so we'll do that. Okay, 1715. And we got a 6 with a carry. That would be an 8 with a, a borrow. That also has a borrow. So we got a 2 with a borrow. So that's the remaining portion. <coughs> All right, so we have a five, and then I look at this number and I say, well, let's divide this by the next power of two. We move down to the power seven to the power of two, which is 49, okay? So this one should be easier. <laughs> so how many 49s can we fit in 286? We know it's not seven. We know it is not six, right? Because your know, six would make it really close to 300, and this is not really that close to 300. So we know it's going to be another five, okay? But we'll double check, okay? I have to get that number anyway. So 49 times five, okay, and I don't, I really should not need to do this. So this, there's a five here with a four, so it's two, four, five, okay? That works out. And what do we do with the 245? Subtractive from 286, okay? So 286 minus 245, you know, this we should be able to do it by hand, right? We just got 41 left, okay? And what do I do with a 41? Well, we look at all the powers that we got figured out already. We got the 7 to the power 3, we got that. We got 5 of those. What about the 49? We got 5 of those too. Now we're moving down to the seven. So we are now figuring out how many seven can I fit into 41. Now this one, I should not need your know, long you know, multiplication. So 41 divided by seven is a five again. Now, trust me, it is coincidental, completely coincidental. And this time I can figure out the remainder right away. It's a remainder of six. Okay, so what do we have now? We have a five, we have another five, 
we have another five, and then we have a six. What are these digits referring to? We got five of three hundred forty-three, which is seven to the power of three. We have five of forty-nine, which is seven to the power of two. We have five of seven, which is seven to the power of one, and then we have six. Of seven to the power of zero, or seven, we have six of one, which is seven to the power of zero. Okay, so how do we put all of this together as a base seven number? So I'm going to carve out this area here to do it. We have so the question is, what is the quantity of seven to the power of three? What is the quantity of seven to the power of two? What is seven to the, what the quantity of seven to the power of one? And what is the quantity of seven to the power of zero? We just figure that out, right? So this five goes here. This five goes here. This five goes here, and this six is then going to go there. So our number is basically five, 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 six in base seven. Is that okay? But you can see that if it's not binary, you actually have to do division. And doing division when your divisor is 343 is not fun. Because when you perform division with this kind of divisor, you actually have to do multiplication implicitly in your head as well. And that's really not a whole lot of fun. Binary numbers, no division needed, just compare. Compare, subtract, compare, subtract, compare, subtract, and you're done. With this one, you have to divide, which has a whole bunch of other stuff in it. Subtract, and then divide again, and then subtract, and then divide again, and then subtract. But yes, we can use you know, base 7 if we want to. Are we doing OK so far with base conversion? All right. So I'm just looking at the time. So now it is time to move on to some notations. So I have just gone through examples to show all kinds of stuff. So what, I'm, what I want to do now is to go into something that is a little bit of an abstraction. Okay, so we'll go to this notation here. So I'm going to read this entire paragraph slowly, and then we'll figure out what that means. So we want a more concise and abstract way to specify how we interpret a number to figure out the value. Why? I think we got the concepts already, but why do we want to use a concise, which means you know, does not use a lot of space, abstract, which means it is applicable across multiple bases, way of describing what I just described. Okay, because you intuitively know the stuff already. So why do I need a different way of representing it? Why? Indeed, why do we have math? Yep. Oh, I thought you had, you had the answer. Yeah, so that's okay. Why? Well, why are you a developer? Why are you programming? Why are you writing code? You are abstracting, okay? Every time you write a program, you are generalizing how to do certain things, okay? So that means, you know, the, the whole approach of abstracting, which means you're losing the details, you're only keeping what is relevant, is a key concept in computer science, in coding, in mathematics, in almost everything STEM. Okay? All right, so if that is the case, what are we gonna do here? Okay, first we need a method to designate each digit in the number. In other words, I need a notation. I need a way to say, I'm referring to the digit representing your know, base to the power of zero. I am I'm, I'm pointing to the digit representing the quantity of two to the power of three and so on. So how do I designate the digits? So I'm using D to represent the digit, or D of I to represent the digit that indicates the quantity of 10 raised to the power of I. 
So that is a description of a notation. D subscript I, at least in this case, is telling me how many 10 to the power of I do I have in a base 10 number. So we are starting with base 10 because we feel comfortable with base 10. Are we good so far? Does everybody understand that particular sentence? Okay, all right, so we shall move on. So in this example, which is referring to this number here, so we have D1 being a 1 because we have 1 of the 10, and then D of 0, which is the number of 10 to the power of 0, is a 6 because that's what we have this 6 here, representing the quantity of 10 to the power of 0. We have D minus 1, subscript minus 1, to be a 3 because we have 3 of 10 to the power of negative 1, and then we have 7 times uh, 10 to the power of negative 2, and so on. So the value is be, that is being represented can now be summarized as d subscript 0, d subscript 0 times 10 to the power of 0 plus d subscript 1 times 10 to the power of 1, d subscript negative 1 times 10 to the power of negative 1, and so on. So I'm just looking at the first line here. Do we have any questions about what that line is trying to tell you? It really is just repeating that same boring message that in a number, the value being represented is the summation of each digit times the base raised to the power corresponding to the position of the digit. That is basically what the first one is trying to say. So if I have a 20 digit number, this is gonna have 20 entries, if I have a 300 digit number, this is going to have 300 items in it. I go like, that's not a good way to do things. I need to generalize it, okay? I need to do an abstraction so that I can use a very simple, concise representation to say, okay, it doesn't really matter how many digits you are dealing, how many digits you're dealing with. This is the general way of adding up those sums, uh, adding up the power, the quantity, I need to reformat. Okay, this is how we represent the sum of the products of digits and the power that they are representing. Oof. Okay, that was difficult. Okay, and that, and now we have the sigma notation. So in the sigma notation, we have an index i. Okay, so this i here is now an index. It's a variable like in the loop. It goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. Remember what I said earlier? I could pad zeros to the left of a number all, my t all the time and it wouldn't change anything because intrinsic to every number is an infinite number of digits. It's just that most of those are not helpful. They're not telling me anything that I do not know already. So same thing with the negative side, which means on the right-hand side, I can pad an infinite number of digits to the right-hand side of the decimal point or the last decimal point and it's not going to change anything. But the most important part here is what I'm adding up is di, which is referring to a particular digit in the number, times 10, because I'm dealing with the base 10 number here, to the power of i. All right, so I'm going to pause here to see if there are any questions about the sigma notation itself. Because I have the assumption that most people have been exposed to the sigma notation, and if not, I need to address that. So you guys need to tell me whether the sigma notation is familiar to you or not. It is? Okay, so anyone, everybody's okay or not? Yeah, um, I have seen this before. You've seen it before? Thank you for the confirmation. I've seen it before, but I can't really give it to you. Okay, that's okay. not unreasonable, so we'll go ahead and talk about that. Okay, so I am going to use my tablet to give you an example, okay? And I will make it super general too, and I'll convert it into C code because we should know C code. Okay, so we'll go ahead and say this is a sigma notation. I'll call the variable again. The index you know, is I again, and this time I'm going to use B for the beginning, and I'm going to use E for the ending. 
So instead of giving you specific values, I'm just going to say eh, B is a variable representing where we start, and E is going to represent where we stop. Okay. And then also, instead of giving you a particular equation, I'm going to say it's a function that makes use of I. Okay, so that makes it very general because now we can say, oh, so it can accommodate every possible situation that we can use the sigma notation for. Okay, so I'm going to convert it into C code now. So I'm going to say double because your F is going to return a double. I'm going to assume it's a double. It can be complex and other things, but for this example, we'll just say it's a double. Um, and we'll call the function sigma, okay, for obvious purposes, because you know, it really is the sigma, you know, a symbol or character, uppercase of sigma. And it's going to have a bunch of parameters. Um, it's going to have int b, int e, and it's going to have, well, that's all I'm going to do, okay? I'm not going to use uh, f as a parameter. How many people, how many people know what is a pointer to a function as a type in C++. You do? Okay, very good. <laughs> but for the most part, I don't think they have enough time in CISP 360 to talk about pointer to functions. I don't really use them, I just know of them. I'm curious about them, but. Oh, okay. So they're really useful um, because they allow you to pass a function as a parameter. Um, it is the predecessor of a lot of object-oriented programming concepts, particularly the, the whole concept of an abstract class with you know, virtual functions or virtual methods. That's a eye candy you know, to dress up, <laughs> but is otherwise you know, pretty ugly in terms of you know, both implementation and also notation. But I'm not gonna you know, put it into here, so we'll just say that's all the parameters that we have. All right, so we'll have um, double result, okay, being the actual result, initialized to zero. And this is actually how I write my code. I would start and go all the way to the end so I don't forget what I need to do. So in between, I will have to do something about the result. So since we are using C++, we can now say for, okay, uh, we'll say int i, it starts with b as the beginning, and as long as i is less than or equal to e, because you know, the last iteration should have i equal to e, so it's less than or equal to, so we catch that one last case, and then for each iteration, hmm, I'm, I'm debating whether I should give you a tricky um, version of this loop. I think I, I'll go for the tricky one because I think you guys should know this also. Okay, so for each iteration, the post operation is um, i gets incremented plus plus i. But nobody says that that has to be the only thing that you specify in the post condition or the post operation. So I can also write this result plus equal to f of i in the loop. And you guys go like, so if everything is folding into the post condition, what is the body of the loop? Nothing. Is this the best way to write this loop? Probably not, okay? But will this work? Yes, it is going to work. I have a one-liner that is going to work. All right, and that's it. I mean, these are all just empty lines. But does this help you understand you know, what the sigma notation is about? Okay, great, okay. Another question. Can I do this recursively? Okay, what is recursion? Okay. All right, and go ahead. Okay, all right, and the function eventually calls itself. It may not be direct, but eventually, if it gets back to call itself, it is recursive. Right. That's one way to do it. It is the most inefficient way to do it, but yes, you can do it that way. 
So the question is, can I do this sigma recursively? And if so, you know, how we do it. Oh, um, I mean, maybe you could, like, in the function, check if we're at B yet, and then if not, then call itself. Yep. And, oh, uh, I guess, def increment i or whatever, and then, and then call itself. Yep. All right, so... All right, so how many people are absolutely not interested in knowing the recursive solution to this problem? And I can skip it. Okay, no one? Okay, so we are going to go for it, okay? We'll go for the recursive answer to this question. Because I think the more exposure you have to recursion, the more you will understand it, okay? So, which I think is really kind of important. So I'm going to move this stuff Oh, no. Okay, I'm not really sure how to copy and paste in this case, but it's okay. I will, I will just write the new version here. Oh, it's doing lasso mode. Let me go back to the pen. There we go. All right. So we have the same prototype here, which is double sigma and b and E, okay? And the whole thing has one single statement, which is a return. We go like, don't we need conditional statements? Yes, we need something that's conditional, but it's not going to be a statement. So what can do something that's conditional, but it is not a statement? Uh, we need a comparison operator, but it needs to do certain things in a certain case, and do other things in a different case. It's called a ternary operator, the question mark and the colon. Okay, so what are we checking? Well, we add, we say if the if b is greater than e, then I should return zero. In other words, uh, we are running out. Okay, the, the the beginning is past the end already, so I got nothing to do here. Okay. But what if b is less than or equal to e? What should I do? Well, the first thing is, I think in this case, f of b is important. I need to figure that out. But what if b is still less than e and we got some more stuff to process? That's OK. I can call myself again. So I can say plus sigma b plus 1, because I just took care of f of b. The next invocation of sigma can start with the next number. So that's why b is incremented by 1, and then e is still the same. And I think that's it. That's the recursive implementation of exactly the same code. So it's another exposure of you know how to use recursion instead of you know uh, what we call iterative logic you know using a loop. Why do you think this is important? There are programming languages out there that do not have loops. Uh, if if anyone is considering transferring to UC Berkeley or Stanford University, I believe they use Lisp or Scheme, you know, which are programming languages that do not have loops. So you ask, so how do they do loops? They do loops like that. It's recursion. Okay? And then later on in this semester, we'll actually learn how to do recursion. We'll write assembly code that implements recursive subroutines. And then you guys will go like, by the, hopefully, by the time we get to the end of the semester, it will demystify recursion to the point that you guys go like, oh, so that is recursion. Boring. Because that's one of the purposes of this class, is to demystify things that is difficult to explain in a higher programming language. But once you understand how it is implemented, you go like, oh, is that it? Yeah, that is it. Okay. Now, it does not negate the difficulty of coming up with recursive definitions. It just means that the mechanism of recursion becomes like, oh, that's easy. 
we get it now. Okay? All right. So the lecture portion is done for this class. We do have a lab. The lab is based on what we did on Monday. So if you did not come up with a design that works on Monday, I will do it now and I'll make it available to you. But I'll also explain the whole process along the way to give you one more chance of you know, kind of practicing, you know, just watching me do it. So I'll try to explain all of the concepts that we uh, need to learn in LogiSim. All right, so this is me doing the assignment on Monday. And there's one person who needs to turn it in so that person cannot copy my solution. All right, so we need two input pins or one single input pin that's a bit wide. So when I use input pins, I always draw, I always take it from the toolbar because it will have the right um, attributes. So the input pin and the output pins are both supposed to be a bit wide. So we go to data bits and crank it up to eight like so. And then we have the usual stuff of you know the power, the ground, that sort of stuff. So I'm just redoing the whole thing from Monday. And then we need transistors. Okay, so first thing we do is rotate it to point south and then duplicate it because I need two of the P type transistors. And then I need two of the N type transistors. So we make copies again. Oh, okay, that didn't work. Let's do it one more time. No. Okay, my fixerity is not too good today. All right, so there we go. And then we need to do a few things here, okay? All right, so these two are supposed to be N-type transistors, so we just have to change the type to N. And they also need to point up, okay, because the source has to go to the negative side, you know, with an N-type transistor. So we have to change the facing, not the facing, yes, facing. We change the facing to north in this case, like so. And I think those are the components that we need. So now I just need to kind of reposition things a little bit, kind of make it look nice. Come on, there we go. And then move this Move this one down a little bit so I got the space. Okay, maybe just zoom in a little bit first. There we go. Yep, there we go. And then move these two into place. And by the way, I have graded the assignment already or the lab. So if you check your grade, you should see a score. Okay. There's that. Okay, they're not exactly aligning, but it's okay. It's still going to work. All right, so here we need a splitter. Okay, so I really do need to kind of explain what a splitter is. So here's a splitter. Okay, a splitter has two ends. One end I would just call the merged end, and then the other end is what I would call the split end. So the way a splitter works is you can control on the merged end how many bits it has. That is the bit width. So it has to be eight in this case. Um, and then the split end is controlled by these numbers here. So for each bit of the merged end, you can say where it comes out of on this split end. Is that okay? I'll say that one more time. For each bit of the merged end, you can select which split end it comes out of. So now it depends on how many split end do I need? Well, in this case, we actually do need two split end. So now the question is, uh, who, who's going to the top and who's going to the bottom? So we'll say bit zero goes to the top, bit one goes to the bottom. The rest of you don't even bother to hook up to the, the, uh, the split end. So we select none for all of the other ones. So I believe this is also in the video that is embedded into the instruction. So if you watch the video, this is like, yeah, Tech, you talked about this already. Yes, I did. And uh, bit two also needs to go to none. So now we basically have the splitter that we need. So the merge end goes to the input pin, which is a bit wide. 
and then the split end goes to the respective um, transistors. So this is not exactly the same design that you have here you know, in the class, but functionally speaking, it should still be the same. There we go. And then this also needs to go to there. And yeah. no one says I have to make this pretty. So I can make it ugly. OK. And then we just have to hook up to the upper pin. So we'll put the upper pin a little bit closer. And I'm going to need the same kind of splitter here. So I will duplicate the splitter and kind of put it on this side. But this time, we only need one split end. So that means the fan out should only be one because the only bit zero is important. So everything else need to connect to none, like so. There we go. And to make it look nicer, I mean, this will work already, except it's going to look really kind of obscure. So in order to make this look nicer, we change the facing. So it would face west, like so. And then just give it a little bit of space here. Move this over here. And put the connection here, go to here. There we go. Is this the best looking, you know, NAND2 gate? No. Will it work? Yeah, it's going to work. So, and then we turn it into a component, which is easy because you just have to click this thing here. It automatically turns it into a component like so. So, if you did not get full score for your Monday lab and you go like, okay, I don't want to rely on my own you know, circuit, you can use this particular one, and I'll just go ahead and send it to the whole class. And let me save it first. So file, save, and we'll call it tax and two. And it's going to put it into, uh, well, I got this one already. So we'll just do it this way and then switch to Canvas. And go to announcement. So I'm going to send it to you by announcement. Go check your announcement for this attachment, uh, except for the person who needs to work on this. And we'll go ahead and announcement, tax, and to submission. And see attached. And go to here. Wrap it. It. There you go. So now everybody has a starting point for your lab today. So for the lab today, you also, it's a little bit like the lab on Monday in the sense that you also need the access code to it. And besides, it's not visible yet. So I would kind of give you both the access code and make it visible to you. And this time, the um, access code is Nandroid. Yes, it is a play of words, OK? Nandroid. There we go. So this is the access code of today's lab activity. And I turned off one particular feature that maybe some people used on the other day. So with this one, I made it so that you know the correct answer will not be disclosed until the end of the lab section, because I think a few people use that feature to figure out all the correct answers, you know, for the first lab, which I would equate to hmm, not as much you know, shooting yourself in the foot, but close, because you know that means you know, you're not really you. Know, Going to you don't have to think about it to find the answer. So this one is not going to give you the right answer, but at least not right away. And it's due at 120. So I'm going to save and publish this one. So now you should be able to see it and start get started with this one. And then the other thing is, I am also going to release the file submission one, and it also has a um, a circuit tester just like with the previous one. So um, 
testing your circuit before submitting is not required, but if people get a less than perfect score, don't blame me. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the idea of why I gave you guys the test circuit. It's like, yeah, check it first. Make sure it works before you turn it in. So you can get started if you want to. If you want a short break, you know, go ahead and take a short break. I'll be here the entire time. You know, if you have any questions, I will come to you and try to answer your question. All right, so anything else before I turn off the recorder? Because we are still recording right now. Nothing, we're good. Okay, all right, so we are, I'm going to turn off the recording.